Welcome to Serge's webinar, How to Survive Spiritual Failure. We are so glad you're with us today. Um, and if you'll bear with us, we're gonna give people a minute or two to sign in. While we wait though, I wanna invite you to find the Q&A function on your Zoom toolbar. And we'll be using this uh, for an interactive question and answer portion towards the end of the webinar, but you can feel free to submit questions at any time um, that you'd like to ask Barbara. If you're just joining us now, welcome. We're really glad to have you here. And again, this is Serge's webinar on the topic of how to survive spiritual failure. If you are new to Serge, we are a Christ-centered, grace-based ministry uh, committed to gospel renewal and mission. What this means is that we send missionaries all over the world, and we also express this grace-based ministry through gospel-centered resources and mentoring ministry leaders. My name is Lindsay Kimball, and I serve as an Associate Director of Mission at Surge, and I mainly work in the areas of global learning, gospel renewal, and counseling care. Our gospel renewal work at Surge really centers around this truth that our deepest and truest identity as believers is that of being sons and daughters of God. That is the truest thing about us. And we're really committed to this reality of God's extravagant grace lavished on his people and expressed in the person of Jesus. We believe that the deeper this truth really rings true in our hearts, the more compellingly the gospel flows out of us um, and through us to the world. So we really seek to help need this truth into the hearts and lives of ministry leaders, of cross-cultural workers and missionaries around the world. And we do that through resources such as mentored sonship, discipler training, and you can see uh, our discipler training website on your screen now. Um, and we also do that through producing small group resources and other, other gospel-centered curriculum. We're also committed to connecting you with other gospel-centered resources uh, that exist out there, including books like Barbara's, uh, Extravagant Grace, Prone to Wander, and Streams of Mercy, um, all authored by our webinar speaker today, Barbara Duguid. And I'll tell you more about Barbara in, a, in just a moment. Don't worry about taking down all this information. We're going to come back to it at the end of the webinar. Um, and a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. As I noted earlier, if you're just signing in, we're going to use the Q&A function in your Zoom toolbar today. And please feel free to submit questions at any point during Barbara's presentation as we work through the content. You can also mark questions as anonymous if you desire. And then we'll spend some time towards the end of the webinar having Barbara field some of those questions for us. You'll also notice the chat and raise hand functions on your screen and we will not be using those functions today. Also just a friendly reminder, uh, some people like to know that while we can, while you can see us and hear us, we can't see you <laughs> or hear you. Um, so you can rest easy as you enjoy the content today. Um, now that many of you have joined us, I want to introduce to you our speaker, Barbara Duguid. Barbara is an author and a pastor's wife who grew up as a missionary kid and a pastor's kid. She earned a Bachelor of Science degree in medical technology from the University of Virginia, and she worked in a missionary hospital in Liberia for two years. While there, she met her husband, Ian, to whom she'd been married for 34 years. She's also earned an advanced certificate in biblical counseling and has worked as a counselor, ministry assistant, writer, and speaker. She's authored three books, which we'll mention at the end of this webinar, and continues to write and speak at conferences. And she's also enjoyed working alongside Ian in his callings as a church planter and seminary professor. Barbara is deeply passionate about her roles as a mom, a grandma, and a breeder of Cavalier King Charles Spaniels. Her dogs have visited dementia units and comforted many people incapacitated by depression and anxiety. The Do Goods have six kids and one grandchild and currently reside in Glenside, PA. Barbara, it is so good to have you with us today, and I'm going to turn things over to you now. Thank you, Lindsay. It is wonderful to be with you, and welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming to join us today to talk about a subject that um, is not fun or light or frivolous, and many people would shy away from wanting to talk about spiritual failure. But thank you for being here. And as we begin, I want to mention just a few things. Um, everything that I say comes from the writings of John Newton, who um, wrote many sermons and letters and counseled many people as a pastor. And his views of Christian growth and sanctification inform this view of Christian growth that I'm going to be talking about. 
Now, I believe, as Newton believed as well, that scripture is of utmost importance in all that uh, we believe. And because this is a 30 minute webinar, I'm not gonna be demonstrating all the scripture that backs up everything that I have to say. So if you want to look into these things more deeply, you'll have to look at some of the other um, resources available to you in the, in the writings of John Newton and some of our Puritan forefathers, their writings as well. I just wanted to let you know that I realize I'm gonna be a bit, um, uh, you know, uh, deficient in giving you sp uh, scriptural examples of everything I'm going to say, but it doesn't mean they aren't there and it would be worthwhile to look them up. You know, personal sinful failure is a very difficult thing to talk about and it's a very hard thing to think about. And because of that, many of us will shy away from giving much thought to our worst sins and failures. They are embarrassing. They sting our human pride. They confuse us, especially uh, those sins that we do try really hard to beat and we find ourselves unable to break free from. Um, the, they defy our identity as independent and strong, competent Christians who love the Lord and want to obey him. And when we struggle with sin, we feel really dirty and guilty and weak and ashamed. So there's so many negative feelings that go along with uh, this subject that it's no wonder that we don't really want to spend much time thinking about our failures. It is, it is confusing. We get discouraged when we cannot meet our own spiritual goals. Well, you know, this time of year, uh, optimism reigns supreme, doesn't it? Many of you prob probably made New Year's resolutions, and maybe they're still going well. Maybe for some of you, they're starting to not go so well. Uh, as you said goodbye to a year that perhaps had some failure in it, maybe a lot of it, and you hope that in the new year, there will be more reform and a better effort. We tend to face New Year's full of determination to try harder and to do better, but it won't be long, will it, before those weaknesses emerge once again, and we fail to live up to our own standards and our hopes and our dreams, and old sins revive with fresh strength, and new ones kind of take us by surprise. You know, I was driving through a very posh neighborhood just last week, and um, all of a sudden, I found myself looking at the beautiful homes around me and being lost in very covetous thoughts. And now I would not normally describe myself to you as a very covetous person, but I do struggle with large house envy. God has allowed us to live in some beautiful homes. And all of a sudden, without even realizing it, without giving myself permission to do it, I was imagining myself uh, living in those homes. I was picking which one I would live in. I was thinking all the reasons why I deserve to live in a home like that when the Holy Spirit grabbed my attention. And I realized I was also full of ingratitude to God. I was wanting things he thought were not good for me, and I was lost in covetousness. And then I was very tempted to spiral into shame, to be undone by that sin. So we often will find ourselves sinning in ways um, we haven't uh, even given ourselves permission yet, and yet there we are. And so that's not a fun subject to talk about, and yet it is a very important subject to talk about. For some of us, our failures are going to be oh, outward and overt and obvious to the world around us. Uh, we simply don't do things that we know that we should, like read the Bible or pray or love others very well or be self-controlled or uh, stop being anxious. We very visibly do not do things that we should, and we very visibly do many things that we shouldn't. We uh, lash out. We act out. For some of us, our sin struggle is very visible. Um, for others, that sin struggle is more inward and more quiet. We are the ones who actually will succeed majestically at goal keeping. Um, those, some of you will be people who do read the Bible through in a year, maybe twice. Maybe you're much further along than you ever dreamed you would be at this point. Um, maybe you will serve God in amazing ways and go to the mission field and give lots of money and serve at soup kitchens and you will be tempted to feel very prideful about these achievements. You will be tempted to judge others who are not doing these things, and you'll look around and wonder, where's everybody else? This is also failure, but it's, all, it's of a more subtle and insidious kind of failure that sometimes is harder to see and admit to. It's failure to be humble, and it's failure to be dependent upon God for any and every good thing that you would do. It's failure to give God credit because it is in some way taking credit for the work that he is doing in you. And it's using the weaknesses of other people to feel good and to feel superior to them, kind of ugly and kind of gross. But one way or the other, no matter how we are doing in our Christian walk, whether we are failing or we are succeeding magically, we experience a great deal of sin in our minds and hearts every single day. 
but we shrink away from this truth because it's hard to face. And often we are very blind to it. The Holy Spirit doesn't show us all our sin uh, all at once. And it's a gradual um, process whereby he opens our eyes to it. But, you know, if we could take every thought captive and think well about what we're thinking about, we would, we would realize that many of our thoughts every day are very, very sinful thoughts. I think of a, drawing a pie chart and um, deciding what slice of pie, what's the size of the slice of pie where my thoughts were actually good thoughts about God, loving him, loving other people. Well, my slice of the pie isn't very big because sometimes I don't even remember that he's there. Uh, and when I think of the thoughts that my mind drifts to throughout the day, in the natural quietness of life, um, when my mind drifts, it's not toward loving and wonderful thoughts, it's usually thoughts about me, relentlessly absorbed in myself one way or another. So we tend to bury our feelings about our sin deep inside. Some of us loathe ourselves with a very sinful type of self-hatred. We tend to wonder about God, what does he think of me? Um, when he knows better than I do what the sin is in my heart. And we wonder that all the more when we struggle with repeated sinful patterns in spite of our best efforts. Not talking about the areas where we aren't trying. I am talking about the areas where we try very hard. And we can be robbed of the joy of our salvation when we find ourselves failing a lot. It makes us doubt our salvation. How could a Christian continue to sin like this? It causes us to hate ourselves, compare ourselves to others, run from God, hide from God, run from other people, and maybe even to have tremendous anger toward God because he simply isn't doing what we want him to do. Well, you know, we do face a difficult dilemma as believers in this world. Scripture calls us to an impossible obedience. Think with me for a minute. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That means you are to love God every minute of every day perfectly. And you are not capable of that. And in this lifetime, you are never even going to get close to that. How about love as Christ has loved you? How about forgive as God has forgiven you? You know, complete sanctification waits for heaven. We know that, don't we? And yet we kind of think we're going to get pretty close if we try hard enough. And yet the truth is that while we live here on earth, we actually don't make much progress. The Heidelberg Catechism says we only make very small beginnings on the roadway to sanctification. Yet we set out to try, and trying is important, and uh, trying to obey God is very important. Uh, but we try as though if we really worked hard at it and did the right things, we could get it perfect. And you know, even more so as we grow in our love for God and we mature in the faith, we love him more, we want to obey him even more. So our failure and sin become harder to tolerate, not easier to tolerate, harder. We think we ought to be much further along. We should be so much holier than we are. And so um, we forget the problem is that we are called to a sweeping obedience and told that while we live in this flesh, in this body, we will be weak and we're going to remain very weak and sinful until the day we see Christ face to face. You know, God is at work in us. We do change. We do grow. In fact, when the Holy Spirit of the living God resides within you, you have no choice but to grow and to change. But God's work in us is slow, isn't it? Christian growth in scripture is often compared to the growth of a plant, and a, a plant that we can't even see it growing. But we get very impatient uh, with growth because we are in a hurry to be perfect. But God is not in a hurry to make us perfect. He's actually up to something much better in this lifetime while we live here on earth. Now, while the power of sin is destroyed completely in a believer, the power of sin to send them to hell, uh, the power of sin to wreak chaos in our lives, and the power of indwelling sin is not destroyed at salvation. And it's very important in the book of Romans, you understand the distinction or you're going to be very confused because in one, at one moment, Paul will say, you know, sin is destroyed, sin is conquered. And the next he'll go on to say, but I struggle with sin every day. The things I want to do, I don't do, and so forth. So you'll have to think well about the two different ways in which that's true, which means we are left with a very severe struggle against indwelling sin. Jeremiah 17, 9 tells us that the heart of man is sinful and deceitful, desperately wicked. Who can understand it? Now, we are a new creation. We have... Christ living within us. He comes to reside within us at the time of salvation, but we're not all new creation. We are new creation 
wedded, knit together physically to this sinful flesh that continues to be very deceitful and desperately wicked. We call that depravity. And if we don't understand this concept of depravity in us, we'll spend a lot of time being confused by it, surprised by it, and undone by it when we see our own sin and the sins of other people around us. Now, perhaps, like I used to think, you thought when you became a Christian that if you just did the right things, you would get better and better every day, that you would morally get better at fighting sin. But perhaps, like me, after many years of loving the Lord, instead of getting better and better, you're seeing more sin instead of less. And maybe old sins are reviving, and maybe you're even struggling uh, with addictions uh, in areas of your life where you don't want to be addicted, but you cannot break free. Perhaps you feel like you're a slave to your idols, and uh, looking for idolatry and trying to defeat it has been a very difficult thing. If you know many older believers, perhaps you realize that Christians, humans, do not go out of this life generally in a blaze of glory. I used to think that we would mature and get older and older, close to perfect, and go out with this blaze of faith and glory. But to be honest with you, uh, I think many of us fizzle. We fizzle out at the end. Um, my dad died in April, and uh, on his floor in his dementia unit were pastors and professors and missionaries, men who had loved the Lord and taught others. And yet on that floor, there was fizzling. There were people who didn't even remember that they had faith, people who maybe were angry with God because of the incapacity that they faced. Weakness and human frailty uh, impacts greatly the way that we feel about God. And instead of getting stronger, we're getting physically weaker. Our minds are getting weaker. And many of us fizzle. And God demonstrates his wonderful glory in that he holds on to people who fizzle out at the end. We don't have to go out in the blaze of glory. But we don't generally get better and better. Well, what do you do when you are unable to uh, grow in areas that you want to grow or stop sinning in ways that you want to in spite of your best efforts? What do you do? when your sin is hurting you and is hurting people around you and you are devastated by it, uh, like I was the day I found myself coveting. Uh, we all have some sins that we hate more than others, which is interesting. And when we find ourselves hating our sin, we set about wanting to get rid of it, don't we? We have uh, many strategies, perhaps, that we are going to employ to try to stop that behavior, and that's good. We need to try to do that. And sooner or later, if we aren't successful, we're going to pray and ask God to change us. And you know, sometimes he does. Sometimes when you pray and you say, Lord, please deliver me from this sin, he comes in and he gives you the desire to stop that sin and the ability to stop sinning, and uh, that, that sin loses its grip on you. But there will always be areas in your life where you will pray to God and ask for deliverance, and he is silent. He is not answering that prayer. And like the Apostle Paul, you find yourself doing the things you don't want to do and not doing the things that you want to do. And that when you want to do good, evil is right there with you. And you are caught instead of in a web of willfulness and rebellion that you cannot break free from. As Christians, as we grow, we hate our sin, and yet we can feel very trapped in it. And when we do, we have an emotional response to it. And the more we love the Lord, perhaps, the, the worse that response is going to be. It's a shameful thing to know that God has loved us and yet we sin. It can feel very hopeless because if you've tried all, everything you can think of and still it's not happening, then what is left? What is left? Perhaps you can feel very angry with God when you plead for change and yet God turns you over to your sin to see what is in your heart. How do you respond? Uh, are you frightened? Are you anxious? Do you wonder what God must think of you? What do you think of him? Um, where does failure leave you when you have tried your hardest and you have failed anyway? Understanding our weakness and thinking well about that has to begin with thinking correctly about God himself. If we get God wrong, we won't understand what he is up to in the midst of our failure. So we want to begin with the question, an important question, why would our loving Heavenly Father plan, ordain, that we struggle with sin after salvation? Now, Whatever he's up to, he is loving. We know that, right? We all agree on that. And we know that he is sovereign, that he made this world. He controls it perfectly. He's never given up control of this universe in any way. We know that he cherishes his children. So whatever he's doing, he is not toying with us or teasing us. And we know he's not punishing us. Having punished his son, 
he will not punish us. We also know that God does all things for the benefit of his beloved children. All things work together for good for those who trust God and are called by him. So even our sin must fit into the all things that work together for good. That can be a shocking thought. So it's good to take time to and pray through this and think through this, that even our sin must work together for our good. Well, God always gets his way in this universe. That's what it means to be God and to be sovereign. It means that all things are equally easy for God. Nothing is without outside of his reach and, uh, or his uh, attention and notice and control. All things are equally easy. So um, he could have decided that when he made us Christians, when we became Christians and regenerated and the Holy Spirit came to live within us, he could have taken out that sinful flesh and left us all new creation and immediately removed that struggle with sin. Um, God could have done that if he wanted to. He can do anything he wants. But his wisdom determined otherwise. Instead of doing that, God did something very different. He left that sinful flesh knit to new creation so that we are two things. Sinful flesh knitted to new creation. We are saints and sinners at the same time. And uh, that can be a very confusing and perplexing experience for us. And instead of increasing perfection, as we grow, instead we start to feel more and more of that sinfulness. And God shows us more and more of our depravity. For Newton, maturity was not about getting better at fighting sin or being more sinless. Spiritual maturity is about seeing our sin more, becoming more humble and more dependent upon God, and seeing that we cannot fix ourselves, that we are no match for that sinful self that God had to deal with decisively. So the Christian life is not about celebrating our growing goodness and how we're getting better at fighting sin. It's for celebrating the goodness of somebody else and seeing that we desperately need the perfect righteousness of somebody else. You see, we are self-focused people. We are obsessed with ourselves. And so to help us take our eyes off of ourselves and to captivate us with something other than ourselves, God turns us over to our sin. We love God more, we want to obey him more, but we find that we cannot do the things we want, like Paul, and we cannot escape in any way our need for Christ. As we grow, the Holy Spirit begins to shine more and more the light on our internal life, and we find out that we can actually have sinful motives even for the good things that we do. We can actually want to obey God for sinful reasons. When I struggled with um, 140 pounds of extra weight, I wanted self-control. I prayed all the time, Lord, I don't care about love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness. I want self-control. But guess what? I wanted it because I was embarrassed and I was ashamed and I didn't want people to know how messed up I was. You see, I wanted something good. I wanted obedience for a sinful reason. So we can have very prideful motives and self-exalting motives for wanting to be obedient. And our obedience can be laced with self-interest when we want to be worshipped and um, adored for uh, our godliness. When, when God shows us these things, we can tend to be undone by our sin and become very discouraged and disgusted and hopeless, impatient with ourselves. Um, think of the words that would map onto how you feel about yourself when you realize that you have sinned really badly. Well, while we live in these sinful bodies, we are always going to have a sinful motive for every good thing that we do. Uh, I hear often from younger people particularly, well, I am going to wait until I have a pure motive to do something good for God. And I tell them, you will be waiting a very long time because while you live on earth, you will always have a sinful motive behind every good thing that you do. Well, what is the answer to this very depressing dilemma that we have? Um, are we consigned to be miserable and uh, just go from one campaign of self-improvement to another and to fail over and over again? Is that really the life of joy that God has planned for us even in this life? Or could there be another way? Is there something else that is out there for us? Well, the Westminster uh, Children's Catechism says, why does God do all things for his own glory? God does all things for his own glory and for the good of his people. So I'm going to launch into uh, several statements now that we're going to fit them together into a theology of sinful failure that um, is going to kind of come together in a cohesive way to form a way to think about your sin. We know that God hates sin. I don't have to persuade you of that. 
We hate sin and he teaches us, his children, to hate sin. We also know that he loves us dearly. He is not messing with us. He is all powerful. He can do all his holy will. And if we put these truths together, we must conclude that God could have made us sinless the minute we were saved. However, you know, from the moment God allowed Satan into the Garden of Eden, it was clear in scripture that he was going to tolerate large amounts of something he hated, sin, for some reason, some good reason. God uses things that he hates to accomplish things that he loves. Um, and as I go on to say what might sound like some surprising things to you, I want to be very clear. Um, we can never blame our sin on God. It's very clear from the book of James, isn't it, that God cannot be tempted. He does not tempt anyone. But when we sin, we are drawn away by the desires of our own sinful hearts and flesh. So our sin is always our own fault all the time. I don't have time to go into that more specifically now. But the next thing we want to think about is the fact that actually God can stop sin anytime he wants to. And once you uh, know that or are looking for that in scripture, it will pop out at you all over the place. You have to think about Satan in the opening chapter of the book of Job having to ask God's permission to mess with Job, and God limits him at each point. Satan cannot sin without God's permission. Uh, you think about Jesus commanding the demons what they can say, what they can't say. Uh, it's astounding that in Genesis 20, verse 6, God says to a pagan king, I stopped you from sinning. I did not let you sleep with Sarai. Um, God can stop human sin anytime he wants to. And there are many uh, examples in my book of biblical narratives where you can see that, con that, that thing at work. God hates sin. He can stop it every time he, want, he wants to, but he often chooses not to. Um, perfection and sinlessness is not actually his will for his children while they live here on earth. He could have had that if he wanted to. His will is that we struggle with that sinful flesh um, and that we work hard to obey and that we are actually weak. Many verses that talk about how weak we are, aren't there? Now, why would a loving Heavenly Father do this? Why would he make us new creation, leave us sinful, call us to try really hard to the sweeping obedience? Well, there must be something that he loves a lot more than our sinless perfection. Uh, there must be something that is more captivating to God than our perfection. We will be perfect one day, and when we see him, we will be that way. Well, 2 Corinthians 4, 7 gives us a little hint of what this might be. It says, we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power and greatness belong to God and not to us. We have Jesus Christ in jars of clay, jars that are not very pretty, not very strong, not very uh, precious or important. They're kind of ugly. Um, in order to show that it's not about the jar of clay, it's about the, the amazing, wonderful treasure that is inside. And we would get very confused about this often because we get, get carried away thinking about the jar of clay. That's us. We think about ourselves all the time. And we want to make ourselves beautiful to God. And we want to um, get stronger and to get better. And we want the glory to go to us. But God is not going to share his glory with us. Neither is it loving for him to do so. That We have the treasure in jars of clay to showcase the treasure. It's all about the treasure. We are glory stealers, but God will not let us do that. The story of redemption is about Jesus Christ, and admiring that jar is never going to bring any joy and peace. It was not meant to do that. It's not supposed to. We are to constantly admire Jesus Christ and to know our great need for him and his amazing faithfulness to us in spite of our ongoing struggle with sin. We are to be captivated by our radiant Savior who willingly left heaven left the beautiful homes in heaven to become weak and sick and tired and tortured and terrified and tempted to be sinned against deeply and uh, constantly in order to rescue us from our hunger for glory. So it's not about the jar. So let's ask this curious question, but how is it that our sin can be good for us? What, what could ever be good about sin? Where our sin reminds us over and over again, of our complete dependence on Christ and our endless need for him. Um, God loves our tiniest efforts to obey, but let's be honest, in the face of the sweeping, perfect holiness that God demands, our tiniest efforts to obey uh, don't measure up at all, do they? This life isn't for impressing God with how well we can try 
it isn't for celebrating us in the jar. It's for seeing our helplessness so that we will celebrate Christ. And the truth is we don't celebrate Christ when we think we're doing well. When we think we're standing strong and obeying God, we're very impressed with ourselves and we want others to be impressed as well. But when we are flat on our faces and we are shredded with failure, then we start to look away. There's nowhere else to look, is there? To see the righteousness of someone else on our behalf, we begin to love the perfection of Jesus Christ. We become ravished by his beauty. And uh, we see that we can never outgrow our need for him. When we really try hard, but we still fail, the message becomes more and more clear that we cannot fix ourselves and there's nothing left to do, but throw ourselves onto the, the heart and the lap of our wonderful savior who has done it all. We are no match for our sinful hearts, but Christ is more than a match for our hearts. And when he sets his love on us, he will not let us go. Nothing can separate us. And so there's an aspect of God's character that we see as repeat offenders, as sinners, that we would never see his forbearance, his patience, his unquenchable love and kindness. God uses failure to teach us tremendous humility and dependence upon him. Well, how can looking at our failure differently change our experience of it in this world? Uh, you know, godly sorrow for sin is important, and we see David doing that really well in Psalm 51. But we often get sucked in, into cycles of self-loathing and self-hatred and shame, don't we? We spiral out in a way that separates us from God, that separates us from other believers, and that really destroys our joy. Believers live very joyless lives because they think that God is really um, invested in their effort and their success. Uh, but God is captivated by the perfect obedience of Jesus Christ, and he gives that to us as a free gift. And that righteousness, that perfect goodness that is given to us as a free gift covers us. It protects us. It becomes our very own. God looks at us, and as we are united to Christ, he sees the perfect record of sinlessness that Jesus earned for us, credited to us, given to us. He looks on us, and he sees Christ. Well, how can that doctrine of imputed righteousness collide with your life in a powerful way so as to change the way you interact with yourself, your failure, the failure of your children, your spouse, people around you? This doctrine has a tremendous power to bring great joy in the, in the midst of tremendous failure in spite of our failure because when we sin, we can ask God to show us the obedience of Christ in the very specific area we are struggling. So to go back to my struggle with covetousness, a dialogue can begin, Lord, I am so sorry uh, I, that I did this and I'm angry with you that you haven't given me the kind of home that I want. I'm sorry that I'm so ungrateful for the home you have given me. Please forgive me. Thank you for Christ who gave up the beautiful home and wealth, uh, who counted them nothing to come and live this life of poverty, of owning nothing in order to win my salvation. And now that righteousness is mine. Oh God, I stand before you filthy with covetousness and yet perfectly clean and holy all at the same time. Does that not lead your heart to worship? Does that not drop you to your knees with delight in your savior? You see how Sin can be this conduit right into gratitude to Jesus Christ and then profound worship for what he has done in spite of our sin. You can actually read through the Gospels very specifically and look for acts of love and goodness and to comfort you when you are struggling. What is hard for you? What are your big areas where you get caught up over and over again? I um, am helping my husband in the ministry and I often fail to love people well. I tend to use people. I get confused. I think that church is the most important thing, and I forget it's the people in the church and loving them that's most important. And I can get bossy, and I can be unloving. And when I see that, it's undoing for me. I feel such shame. It's, it's just an awful, awful feeling. But I can look at Jesus in the Gospels, loving perfectly, uh, stopping on a busy day to pay attention to people, uh, to care for them. And I know that his goodness now is mine and that I have this record of perfect loving. And that gives me the courage to keep trying. It gives me the um, emotional fortitude to know that I'm okay. I am safe. I am wrapped in the love of Jesus Christ and his love that he did on my behalf. And I can try again to love people and grow in baby steps. What are you struggling with? What are the besetting sins in your life where you're trying hard 
and not uh, succeeding. Some of, for some of us, it's sexual sin. We can look in Luke 7 and we see Jesus in the home of a Pharisee letting a prostitute touch him, risking temptation, risking his reputation, and yet staying strong and fast because we would be such sexual sinners. And we can know that his sexual goodness and purity covers us and that we are free to come back to him for forgiveness over and over and keep trying and to grow slowly in baby steps as we really seek to grow in obedience. Newton says that our most breathtaking glimpses of God will come right on the heels of our most mortifying sins. Isn't that interesting? Our most beautiful, glorious glimpses of Christ can come right on the heels of our worst sin. This truth lifts us, our eyes up off ourselves, right? Helps us not to focus on us. It turns our mind and our hearts toward God. It wraps us in the successes of Jesus Christ that cannot be lost or dimmed, no matter what sin you're struggling with. We can know that Jesus faced temptation stunningly and succeeded perfectly in every thought, word, and deed, and that that obedience belongs to us. Um, it, is though, it is as though we are truly completely sinless, even though we completely sin. And we can know that we are safe and loved and cherished, and that gospel gives us courage to stay in the game and not be undone and become paralyzed by our failure over and over again. The whole gospel, double imputation, my sin credited to Christ, his goodness given to me has great power to change the emotional landscape of your life. You can celebrate Christ when you succeed and when you fail. You can try hard to obey God, but not be undone by your failure. You can trust that you are right in God's will. Even when you are failing miserably, you are where he wants you to be, and he's going to use even your sin for your benefit to help you grow, and he will also get glory as the God who loves sinners and is patient with them. Um, each time you sin, God will use it to bring glory to himself. And he will cause even your sin to um, write the story of salvation as his will is worked out. And when he wants to stop you from sinning, he will. He can. And when he allows you to sin, he will use it. Um, so to turn more quickly away from yourself, to adore Christ more rapidly, to be ravished by Christ instead of by yourself, to be dazzled by the beauty of this wonderful Savior. All of these things are the good things that God does through turning you over to sin. And in this way, we can become undone with gratitude and joy for how he has wrapped us up in the royal robes of his goodness and joined us to himself forever. Lindsay, I'll turn it back over to you. Great, thank you so much, Barbara. Um, if you haven't had a chance already, I'd encourage you to submit questions to the Q&A button on your screen. And I'm gonna be um, asking Barbara some of your questions this morning for a few minutes, and I'll be picking questions that are just most representative of what Barbara has spoken about to us. So, Barbara, here's your first question. I was struck by the thought that I can have a form of spiritual failure even when I appear outwardly to be succeeding. How do you notice this in yourself and how can I be successful and avoid this trap? That's a great question. Um, you know, God is very kind. He does not show us all of our sin uh, right away. And this tends to be something we see more and more of as we grow in him and it's hard to see. We are generally very blind to our sin and to ourselves. So this is not something that we can just do for ourselves. Um, you can pray and ask God to begin to show you the motives. And I think using the word motives would help. Um, it, when you start to see some of the reasons that you do things, you'll begin to understand that your desire for even good things comes from a, a sinful place, as well as a good place. It's not just a sinful place. You will have good motives because you really do love the Lord and you really do want to obey him, but you will also have sinful motives and that will be hard. That's hard to bear when we start to see that. It's a good thing that you want to see it. Um, you can ask God. I hesitate to say this. You can ask other people to help you with that, but that doesn't generally go too well because uh, it's hard to hear other people point out our sins, but that's a gutsy thing that you could do. But just pray that the Lord in his time 
uh, as you can bear it, would begin to show you your heart more and more so that you see that more clearly. Great. Thanks, Barbara. Here's another question. How can the righteousness of Christ imputed to us not be a co not become a covering or an inward excuse for sin? I'm sure at times, because we are sinful, we might use it that way. Uh, but it's yeah. wonderful that the righteousness of Christ covers us even then. Mm -hmm. um, I don't trust people with their spiritual growth. I trust the Holy Spirit at work in you, that as he makes the righteousness of Christ more precious to you, um, you want to sin less and not more. All of these truths that I talk about generally increase your desire for holiness mm -hmm. and your love for the Lord uh, over a period of time. So will there be moments where that might happen? Sure. Mm -hmm. But in general, the Holy Spirit's at work in you, and his job is to show you Christ. Mm -hmm. And so that's not going to be the tenor of what, what happens with you. And the Holy Spirit's job, job is also to call you to repentance. So I trust that if you belong to Christ, you will be growing and seeing that more clearly. You will be loving it more. You'll be hating your sin more. And you will be wanting to repent more and more of sin. That's great. And I think it gets at the relational aspect of our sin towards God, right? And the relational aspect of grace, <laughs> of when we are really ravished by Christ, um, our heart's response isn't to go on sinning, but to, to be like Jesus. Um, I have... Another question here. How can we celebrate spiritual growth without falling into the trap of sin and pride or leading others into comparison? Well, once again, you can't do that without the help of the Holy Spirit because it's very, very natural for you to feel proud. And you know that voice of self-exaltation and worship that's in the back of your head all the time? Uh, and in, kind of inversely, the self-condemnation that is there all the time. You're not going to be able to get away from that. But if God would give you grace to see them and confess them uh, and ask for his help, that would be a really, really good thing. Mm -hmm. Because some people get paralyzed, right? If every good thing that I do is also going to have this sinful response in it, I'm just not going to do anything. Mm -hmm. And we can become paralyzed. But we can also become bold and not be so undone by that sinful flesh. The, the conquering of that flesh can be also be... I am not going to let the fact that I am a sinner undo me. If God planned that, if God is in control of that, I'm going to march forward confessing my sin, asking for help, asking for forgiveness, and live boldly. Um, and so that's something you'll need the Holy Spirit to help you do. But those are ways in which I can think of that even though that, that self-adulation is happening, you can bring that outward and confess that to people around you. And... Um, Confess that to the Lord. I love that. Um, here's a practical question. How do you practice leaning on Christ's righteousness in your daily life? So do you have any um, tips for more readily, I guess, being ravished by Jesus, like, like dwelling on the gift of the work of Christ uh, to us? Of course, reading great material that immerses you in these doctrines. Um, I love the writings of our Puritan forefathers and many of the great preachers of the past. All of this is old truth. None of this is new. It's very old truth. Um, and then listening to preachers that will help you with this. Sermons. I love, you know, my, my best quiet times are listening to sermons because I'm not a great self-feeder. Um, and so when pastors, preachers help me with what that looks like and sounds like, that's a wonderful thing. Music that holds out Christ's righteousness before you. More and more, there's wonderful songs written that highlight and showcase that. All of these things can, can really be helpful in terms of immersing yourself in those thoughts that then the Lord might bring to mind at the right time. Mm -hmm. That's great. And it sounds like you've also said, like, even even the practice of seeing your own sin, that's a pathway to dwelling on the righteousness of Jesus. Um, here's a question I can resonate with this. How do we keep ourselves from a depression that comes from constantly spiritual, constant spiritual introspection, where we're question, questioning our own motives and seeing our sinfulness and looking to Jesus for forgiveness and this yo-yo effect? It can feel like spiritual schizophrenia. <laughs> It really does. It really feels like you are two people at one time, and um, 
I know I'll sound like a broken record, but you cannot rescue yourself from this. Uh, being coming aware of it means the Holy Spirit is showing you something. So that's that's really wonderful, and the Holy Spirit will need to continue that work um, of when you catch yourself spinning out into these patterns of self-loathing. Uh, a good thing to do would be to get help from somebody who you know is going to point you back toward the gospel. You don't want help from somebody who's going to load the law upon you and uh, make it all worse. You need gospel-centered people who don't take your sin and failure as though, um, you know, this should not be, a, who understand, yeah, you know, sinners sin, that's what we do, but we have a great Savior mm -hmm. and who will point you in that direction. So if you are, if this is happening in you a lot, I'm a counselor, and so I get the privilege of helping people with that in the counseling room as a friend, as a mom, as a spouse, helping one another. If, if you're going through that yo-yo a lot, it's very intense, and you're at the beginning stages of really wanting to break free from that, then I would say get help mm -hmm. and, and go to Bible studies where you're going to just be constantly pointed back to Christ, uh, no matter how much you want to head that other direction. Great, great. Here, here's another one for you. You guys are submitting lots of great questions. This one says, how do we reconcile this grace with Christ's demand that unless we renounce all we have, we cannot be his disciples in Luke 14? And Jesus's words that whoever keeps his commands is the one who truly loves him in John 14. These are pretty heavy words. And even though our obedience is laced with imperfection to Jesus, it seems very important. Well, there's another example of the sweeping obedience that you're called to that you will never get close to, okay? Um, yes, we are called to try to obey his commands, and our tiniest efforts are very precious to God, but your tiniest efforts to obey don't even come close to what God demands of you. So you will never, uh, whether you're trying or not, be able to get away from your need for Christ's righteousness. Mm -hmm. So whenever we encounter verses like that, we have to think, well, I'm so bad at this. I'm never going to get good at this. I'm going to try. I, I want to grow in this. And it is important to God. But I must cast myself on Jesus Christ as the one who obeyed all of God's commands, who left parents, who, did, who left everything behind, literally, spiritually, and in every way, to obey this. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, every time you come against a command like that, it would be good for you to think of the ways in which you absolutely cannot do it how you should try, but you cannot do it, and how you need Christ to do it for you, and how you can celebrate the fact that he has done it for you. Amen. What in your counseling experience is the greatest stumbling block you find that people have to enjoying the grace of Jesus secured at the cross? So are there any, are there any blockages you see that people have that come up again and again when you work with people? Well, I guess because this is the thing that I talk about the most, I would have to say, as I travel around speaking, as I get to know people, their failure is the biggest block to joy in Christ mm -hmm. and the joy of their salvation. And they think if I could just do well, and if I could just obey God and get better, I could really love being a Christian and enjoy my salvation. Um, but I can't because uh, I have these areas of besetting sin that I can't break free from. So it is their own performance and their own addiction to their performance uh, and their failure that keeps them from being able to know the joy of their salvation. And sometimes, sometimes that will be um, heightened, you know, by things, all kinds of emotional struggles. Those, those, there are a million different things that will inform the intensity of that particular struggle. For instance, if you're raised in a home where perfection was demanded of you, then your struggle with this issue might be a little bit harder than if you were raised in a home where failure wasn't faced with um, outrage or punishment. So there are many different you know, pieces that would inform that. Um, we have a, a listener asking about whether this content is similar to what is in your book, Extravagant Grace. So I wanted to actually invite you to, sh to share a little bit about the premise of your book um, for people who are interested in hearing more. Um, extravagant grace comes from the teachings and observations of John Newton, who was a pastor who loved people, um, believed in the authority and inspiration of scripture and loved the word of God and was theologically very astute. 
and he liked to study how God grows people from the time they become a Christian to the time that they're mature believers and what it looks like to be a mature believer. And he turns that topic on its head for us um, and, and presses home what scripture says that humility and dependence mark maturity and not necessarily um, sinlessness. So the book is a study on what Christian growth is supposed to look like so that you can have good expectations, proper expectations for yourself, to understand what God expects from you, and then to understand the great joy that you have in Christ when you really get, get the fact that he has done it all for you, that your salvation and sanctification are all of grace. Mm -hmm. And yes, in the book, I have done a better job of shoring everything up with scripture, taking the argument step by step very gradually. Uh, so that you can be checking with scripture often and, um, yeah, leading you to, to see where joy in Christ can be found. When you can't find joy in yourself at all, mm -hmm. you can still find great joy in Christ. Mm -hmm. That's great. And we have one more question. Um, well, we have a lot more questions, but we have time for one more question. And that is, uh, my spiritual growth is often slow, and it just can feel so frustrating to feel like I'm not growing in the Lord even when I try. Do you have any advice? Yes, I think that we all struggle with that because we really love God and we want to be holy. We want to be holy, but um, God's plan for us and his agenda are what is going to happen. And lovingly, God is at work in you according to his will, and he's doing it in the order that he wants to do it and in the at the pace that he wants to do it. And his, mm -hmm. he is ordering his sanctification. He's walking you through it step by step. And I want you first to be comforted by the fact that though you wish you were further ahead, you are exactly where God wants you to be, okay? His will can't be thwarted for you. Um, mm -hmm. he, he has you exactly where he wants you to be. It's supposed to be slow. And he's loving you in that, though it feels frustrating. Mm -hmm. um, and he is going to continue this work. You know, uh, in Philippians, we read that he who began a good work will finish it on the day that we see him. And if God could help you not get so caught up in how you're doing, mm -hmm. uh, not so um, tied in knots when you fail, if, you, if God would help you to trust him with that process instead of, instead of thinking it's up to you and that you have to do it all, Mm -hmm. um, then you're going to really find great comfort and joy, and you're going to find delight in living life more richly and joyfully. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you so much, Barbara. Um, you know, I'm, one of the things I wrote down while you were talking was what you said about the most glorious picture of Christ can come right on the heels of our worst sins. And just that idea of being ravished by Jesus rather than looking at ourselves and our own failures and letting our failures lead us to, to experiencing who, who Christ is and, and his work on the cross. Um, so thank you for allowing us to dwell on the truth of the gospel that's more amazing than we even can wrap our heads around. Uh, once again, you can read more from Barbara in her books, Extravagant Grace, Prone to Wander, and Streams of Mercy. And for those of you who are attending live right now, we'll have links in the follow-up email you receive tomorrow to all of those resources. You can also check out all of Surge's resources, including our Discipler Training Program, which launches new cohorts this spring at www.surge.org resources. And our next webinar is called Witnessing from Weakness, and it will take place on Wednesday, February 20th at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. It will be presented by pastor, counselor, storyteller, and longtime Surge friend, Chuck Holliday. Chuck is inspiring and full of joy for the gospel, so mark it on your calendar now. We'll have the link to register for that in the follow-up email as well that you'll receive tomorrow. We'll also include links to the resources I mentioned earlier, and a link to access the video recording of this webinar. So you can watch for, for those in the email too. Finally, if you'd like to learn more about Surge, other resources, future webinars, and the areas we serve around the world, we invite you to check it out at www.surge.org. As always, it's been really a gift to be with you all today. Thanks for engaging with the Q&A and asking such great questions. Um, and we're so happy you joined us. So thank you and thanks to you, Barbara. Have a great day, everyone.